view at growing a uh, growing militarisation, not just in Britain, but across the board. And we're particularly pleased to welcome Warren Smith from the Maritime Union of Australia. I'll introduce Warren in more detail when we take him to speak. And we've got two other people on the first panel. That's Mick Burke, Michael Burke, who's an economist, a former um, <clears throat> senior international economist with the uh, with Citibank's London office. Nowadays, he's uh, an advisor to various parliamentarians, and he's also um, a regular contributor to, to Socialist Economic Bulletin. We'll be putting some of the links in the um, in the in the chat for you as we go along. Um, Mick is going to be our first speaker. We're also waiting for Billy Hayes to join us. A lot of you will know Billy as a, a former General Secretary of the Communication Workers Union. Billy nowadays is a local councillor, has got uh, a, a local activity he's got to attend. So he's already informed us he's joining late. We'll say hello when he comes on. OK, so let's start. Um, our speakers have got 10, <coughs> excuse me, have got 10 to 12 minutes to introduce what they want to say. And then there's plenty of time for your question and answer. If you'd like to put your questions in the Q&A as we go along, then I'll filter them to our speakers once we get to the discussion part of the meeting. Carol, so, can you hear me? Ah, Billy, hi. Ah. <laughs> Welcome, Billy. I've just announced that you're in our first Yeah. Panel. I've... <laughs> I, I, I'm on my phone, so it's a bit difficult, but, I, you know, I'll do my best. I've had problems with my computer and my phone, but so you've got my voice. I'm sorry you haven't got my video. Otherwise, it need to, OK, so I'm here, yeah? We've got your voice loud and clear. We're going okay, to take okay. Mick, who's about to start his contribution, and then we'll call on you. Okay, so okay. thanks very much to all our three panellists for joining us. Mick, over to okay. you. OK, thanks, everyone, and thanks to the organisers for inviting me. If it's OK, I'm going to share my screen because I'm going to throw yes. some numbers at you. And I think it's always easier if you do that uh, and uh, do it graphically um, because people can follow it then. Um, and I'll just do that uh, and then that and that I th is that what slideshow right okay sorry for that um yeah this um topic is self-evident um and i think it's very important and to my knowledge the cnd was the originator of this general slogan which i think should be taken up as by the labor movement as a whole uh, because the situation in this country is dire it's pretty bad in most of the oecd countries and yet many of them who are especially if they're nato members are also being urged to increase their military spending um when there's much better things we could be spending on and i'll come on to that just firstly about this country uh because there's a lot of nonsense uh spoken about how well, little we spend on uh, the military budget and bearing in mind we do face a very grave economic situation in this country it's the only g7 country where inflation is still rising and the economy is stagnant what economists who love jargon uh, call stagflation and yet when there's no money for x where well, x is a lot of good things that would benefit society uh, there is money for weaponry, and this just shows in the NATO. But this is this is this data is taken from NATO, uh, so fairly impeccable source. And actually, Britain spends more than Germany, Belgium, Denmark, and the Czech Republic put together on its military budget. Now, there are countries in NATO, uh, Poland and Greece, apart from the US, that spend more as a proportion of GDP they do for historic and political reasons, which I don't need to go into, uh, and I don't need to um, defend, because uh, I can't. Um, but it's not the case that countries like 
Germany, Belgium, Denmark, and the Czech Republic are not concerned with their own defence. Um, it's just that we spend more than all of them put together on defence. And actually, if you look at the role of the British military over the um, most recent period, but also several decades, it's hardly what you might call a defensive operation, i.e. Britain has not come under attack, but it has participated in attacks on other countries. This is, um, I don't expect anyone to memorize this, but if people want the slide presentation later, I'm happy just to put it in the chat. Um, it's to show what the trends have been in, um, in spending on defense. And I want to draw people's attention to the second half of what, this is This is all from the House of Commons Library, this, this section. The second half of the first chart where it shows the fall in military spending as a proportion of GDP. We now know that it's already up over 2%, excuse me, of GDP again. And the government has a target of 2.5% of GDP. What I would draw people's attention to is two things in relation to that. One is that the fall in defence spending as a proportion of GDP did not, was or was not accompanied by any greater risks to this country. Uh, and when it fell below 2% uh, of GDP, briefly under Cameron and Osborne, um, the heavens didn't fall in, we weren't invaded. I.e., there's no magic uh, formula uh, that says we have to have higher defence spending or that it must be over a certain limit. It's a political choice. And what we see from the table accompanying this is that there was a choice in 2022-23 to really significantly increase the military budget, 9.4%, when other departments were generally being slashed. Um, so it's a political choice, and it has no negative risk consequences to this country to reduce the military budget to a more sensible level. Uh, what a sensible level is, is a matter of political choice. And this is just to confirm it. Uh, this was the last budget um, in March. Uh, other, um, this is all the increases in spending, I should say, uh, not the cuts to spending, and certainly not the cuts to spending in real terms, uh, which were faced by all the departments like health, education, transport, and all the rest. This was the increase increases in spending. What you'll see actually is by far the biggest increases in spending were subsidies to businesses, the temporary 100% capital allowances eating up 8, point, uh, 8 billion um, in the next uh, of the current financial year and 10.7 billion and 8.7 and 8 .7 billion in subsequent years. But the big outlay in terms of new spending for department was defence. So there's a clear um, bias and prejudice in policy making when everything else is being cut to, on the one hand, subsidise big business and to increase the defence budget. That is not a recipe for either peace or prosperity. And then I want to talk about the, um, the what's in the jargon, in the military jargon, is called the dead weight uh, sorry, not dead, in the economic jargon, it's called the dead weight loss of military spending. That's when you, uh, what economists call something that's spent, uh, but has no beneficial effect. And almost by definition, military spending doesn't have a beneficial effect. If, for example, you spend 100 million on creating wind farms, at the end of it, end of it you've got new renewable sources of energy. If you spend 100 million on uh, weaponry, all you can do is fire it to destroy something. Um, so all the uh, costs associated with the military are in effect dead weight. Now, one of the arguments is that actually it employs people and it generates um, income for the arms industry. But I've done a comparison here um, with the NHS. And the NHS is a good comparison in my view because it's a high tech business. I know the bit of it we see, the doctor or your nurse is not necessarily, you think the first thing you think out, oh, there's a lot of machinery and technology behind this, but there's an, an enormous amount of machinery and technology in the NHS 
And there's also an enormous expenditure on its ordinary um, throughputs, i.e. the drugs we all use when, we, when we're when we ill. Um, so they are quite comparable in that sense. And the short response to you know the idea that the spending on the arms sector uh, is beneficial economically can be easily debunked um, by reference to the fact that the NHS spends um, uh, a little over uh, four times what's spent on um, the military budget uh, and yet employs 10 times as many people. I.e., if your sole criteria uh, in policymaking was what's economically benef beneficial, you would say it would be really economically beneficial to slash defence spending and increase it on health because that's going to have a greater employment effect and it's going to have no dead weight loss because you can't you can't do anything with a weapon whereas you've improved someone's health uh, that has all sorts of other savings in the economy as well as a benefit to the individual and including um they people can be uh, readied for work again uh, lots of people would like to go to work but for example are on the 7.4 million waiting list for the nhs um now, one caveat to all this, there's a very good book, which I'm sure many of you will have read at the time. Uh, it came out, I think, in 2008. It's by uh, Joseph Stiglitz and Linda Bilmes. And they call it the $3 trillion war. It's about the Iraq war, what the real costs of the Iraq war were. Oddly enough, a congr congressional budget uh, committee, or maybe the congressional budget office, did its own study and came up with a with the number of three and a half trillion so it's not an exaggeration but the relevance of it in this case is that stiglitz and bilms say that while there's enormous amounts of hiding uh false accounting uh and so on uh that takes place in the u.s military budget it's they say at one point they looked into uk military spending and by comparison, the US is a model of transparency. <laughs> so there's an enormous hiding of the real cost of the military. Just one obvious example is in the um, treatment of soldiers and their victims, um, that doesn't count as, apart from the initial patching up on the battlefield, that doesn't, that's not counted as a cost of the military, that's counted as a cost of the NHS. Um, similarly, with loads of property, that's regard that's spread all over a series of government departments. Um, the reality of the costs of the British military are far higher than stated in the official figures. And then I just want to finish on this bit, really, which is not prescriptive. These are suggestions. And I don't think anyone could or should, any single individual could or should have a prescription for what would, could be done as an alternative and what the real uh, level of defence spending should be, in my view, obviously, from what I've said, it should be lower and significantly lower. But this is just an example. So if you cut the current budget target from what the government wants by 2030 of 2.5% of GDP down to 2% 2, 2 of GDP, that would be an extra 13 billion quid for government spending. That's a significant amount of money. Um, uh, it's equal to the entire aid budget now, which has been cut from 0.7% of GDP to 05 And just as a reference point, I'm not suggesting solely that money could be spent in this way, but every public sector worker in the country could get an extra £2,230 a year if that was done. Of course, if you go further and deeper in the military uh, budget cuts, you can do more. Um, or an alternative, you could increase every public sector workers pay by 2000 a year and you could reintroduce universal free school meals and you could end the two child welfare cap you know the people talk about reducing poverty that's a direct way of reducing poverty it doesn't actually cost very much and all you've done on this is gone from two and a half percent to two percent of gdp spent on the military or, and this would be my preference, or if we were having, you know, something like a people's budget, this would be what I would argue for. You actually use the 13 billion to invest because the definition of investment is that there's a financial return on it, i.e. it's a greater number than what you started with. 
And the way to grow the economy and the way to get out of this crisis generally, in my view, is investment. But with that investment, say in the green economy, say with wind farms or um, uh, solar panels or retrofitting homes or whatever it might be, you can generate returns for the state. Uh, you can cut people's energy bills. And with the returns on the, on the government investment, you can then use the proceeds either for more investment or for all the good things we want to do in terms of making people's lives better, whether it's pay, improvement of public services, poverty reduction, tackling climate change, all those are on the table um, with a cut in military spending. Increasing military spending is just a dead weight. It goes nowhere. Uh, and unfortunately, I think in the past has led to Britain attempting to play an outsized role in US military adventures, which it's really not capable of doing uh, solely for political reasons. Okay, I'll finish with that. Thank you very much, Mick. Um, finish more or less on time, and there's a considerable <laughs> amount of thought behind all those statistics. Um, it's Although you focused on Britain primarily, when we hear from um, Warren in the first panel and from Steve Morse from Veterans for Peace in the USA in the second panel, one of the things we'll be picking up is that the situation of growing military costs is a sort of a global phenomenon or a phenomenon amongst the, um, the majority of, of developed economies. I just wanted to point out two things before I hand this over to Billy. The first is that the Labour CND statement um, there will be a link if there isn't already in the chat that you can pick up. The Labour CND statement on wages, not weapons, points out in a few sentences how outrageous um, Jeremy Hunt's budget, Chancellor's, as announced by the Chancellor at the end of March. So not only is Britain the highest European spender as a proportion of GDP, it's over 2.2% by now. Um, but it's going up. Uh, it's going up considerably over the next uh, couple of years. It will primarily be used for um, the, uh, the Ukraine war and various uh, trident, various nuclear weapons things. And over a period of time, the Conservative government cross our fingers that we do actually get rid of them in the election next year, the Conservative government plans to raise the defence budget by 2.5%, which is, of course, unlike other big budgets, it's inflation protected. So it goes up not just by the amount that the government promises, but the amount plus inflation. And that's not true of other social budgets. OK, that's enough for me. I'm going to hand over to Billy now. Most people will know Billy as the former General Secretary of the Communication Workers Union. Billy's also a member of Stop the War Officers, as am I and is very active in pointing out the immorality and contradictions of war. Um, and he's currently, nowadays, is a local councillor in, um, in London for the borough of Merton. So, Billy, over to you. You've got about 10 minutes. Thanks for joining us. OK, Cal, thanks very much. And thanks for um, listening to me as opposed to seeing me because of uh, the difficulties of that. Uh, with these uh, communications. Yeah, I've been around for a while in terms of activity, just on the Merton front. I've just, as a councillor in the last year, we've become a living wage employer and set aside uh, £8 million uh, for procurement to ensure all our contractors are paid a living wage. So I'm doing my bit. Uh, but I've always had an interest in these big issues, and I'll try and do a little bit of a pot of history and then why I think it's important to be active in terms of peace. Um, when I got started in Liverpool in, in my local branch, local was then UPW branch, a very right-wing branch. And uh, there was a debate about joining CND, just the cusp of the beginnings of uh, the revival of CND around about 79. And the local right-wingers said to us, oh, well, you put it to the members in the branch. And, you know, in other words, 
because of all the kind of um, anti-left type stuff, anti-peace type stuff, we'd get defeated. Uh, it would be de- they would defeat us. And as it turned out, at a very big meeting, um, we won the vote to affiliate to CND, and I think Merseyside branch is still uh, affiliated to CND. And I think when the facts are presented to the average activist in the main, a bit more different with the general public, we went hands down and just listened to Mick's uh, presentation there. That's uh, evidence of it. But I, my learning arc is when we, so we went from that and then we went to the mid 80s when I became a delegate to the Labour Party conference for the UPW, I think it was, then 86, yes. And I went to a European CND event. And uh, that was the one where Ben Elton was speaking. It was in Blackpool. It was a fantastic event. And somebody who went on to be a general secretary in the CW, I'll leave you to guess who that was, said to me, oh, it's a, it's a consensus now in terms of um, being anti, anti, anti the bomb and all the rest of it. And then subsequently, a, a few years later, uh, at a Labour Party NEC, Tony Clark, who was then the Deputy General Secretary of um, the UCW moved the motion at the NEC to basically uptake the so-called um, unilateral, multilateral approach to when Kinnick and Co were rolling back on the support for CND. He got that. He did, he got it got amended at RDC, and then on the floor of conference, he he switched it again, and we have a big row. So I've been there when we were at our height and then when it became uh, a peak. And the thing that strikes me, particularly listening to the stuff that Mick was talking about, is the, the line in that Billy Bragg song where he talks about war's always been the boss's waster. And it always is a diversion, uh, supporting uh, the establishment line on war and all the rest of it, uh, in terms of activity. So to me, it's important that you know we be good activists in the workplace, but take up the fundamental issues based on the, the type of stats that uh, Mick has uh, produced and show how we're getting seen off in terms of, in terms of um, support for militarism and in particular nuclear weapons. It's always struck me as a bit odd uh, that the UK uh, has nuclear weapons and yet it's part of a NATO. But of course, the Yanks have the weapons, and the Yanks are the ones who sponsor, um, the, who, who give the right for Britain to use nuclear weapons if we were in, in that kind of situation. While places like Germany get away with, if you like, if that's the right word expression, get away with the idea of not having to spend, and yet that, that and it can be seen. I'm sure it can be demonstrated how that benefits the their economy. So I think it's important for activists to, to be aware of both. And Carol said, I've always been a, a bit of a peacenik, to use an old phrase. And I was one of the people who spoke. Um, we've lost Billy momentarily. I announced right at the beginning for people who may have joined a little late that Billy is at a, a local event, is outdoors at a local event. And I presume he's lost his uh, internet connection. So we'll go back to him when we can. Um, and just to mention before I pass over to Warren, um, just to mention that we've already had at least one comment that I've picked up, there might be more by now, one comment in the chat welcoming Mick's contribution. We will put that up on the that um, presentation up on the Labour CND website, Mick, if that's okay with you. Um, and we're now going to, so we've had about half of, of Billy's contribution. I'm now going to pass over to Warren Smith and I've got a number of things to say in the way of introduction before I do that. First of all, a very personally, a very big thank you for joining us at the end of the evening, Mick, because it's end of the morning for us. But if you're in Australia as you are, your time zone um, 
puts it fairly close to bedtime. So we're particularly appreciative that you've chosen to join us. You have spoken for CND and for Stop the War before, I'm aware of that. Um, and one of the reasons that we're particularly glad to welcome you back today onto this uh, webinar is because of the fantastic work that the Maritime Union of Australia has been doing around AUKUS, which I'm sure you're going to touch on a bit more when you make your contribution for that excellent statement that you made when the uh, agreement was signed and the work you continue to do. And no doubt you've got more to say about developments in Australia, as well as adding your thoughts to the general questions that we're discussing. So thanks again and over to you. Well, th thanks, Carol, and um, uh, appreciate the uh, invitation and opportunity to um, speak. Uh, firstly, I'm I, I come to you uh, from Bidjigal land in southwest Sydney and pay respects to elders past and present and recognise we're on stolen land and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, we're heading into a, uh, a referendum uh, around constitutional recognition for First Nations people in Australia heading up in October that's uh, recently uh, been announced by the relatively recent um, Labor government um, that will seek to have a voice to parliament, um, but also to recognise as well as voice treaty and truth in the um, you know, long oppression and ultimately genocide of Australia's First Nations people. Um, our union has a history of campaigning for peace and in opposition to war. Um, I've mentioned it before, one in eight seafarers died in the Second World War and it left, leaves a cultural and political legacy. Um, our union was active um, in opposition to the Vietnam War, Iraq and Afghanistan. I think we were the first union to actually um, put bans on vessels and seafarers refused to sail ships uh, to Vietnam. Um, and there's a long recognition that war kills working people and war for the division of markets and geopolitical corporate power uses working people as cannon fodder. And I think that's one of the main reasons why we would say that peace is union business. And there's been a history, a long history of opposition to nuclear power and nuclear weapons in Australia. We don't have nuclear power, don't want it. Uh, the broader trade union movement or community, um, generally speaking, does not want nuclear power. And we've opposed nuclear weapons. I think that's uh, a broad community consensus in opposition to nuclear weapons. And there's obviously ongoing struggles around um, supporting ICANN and the ongoing abolition of nuclear weapons. Um, and we believe they should be abolished. Um, they come with inherent dangers to the community and to the environment. And the AUKUS Pact, I think, has reignited that debate around nuclear power uh, through uh, the nuclear submarines legitimising, in some respects, that position. But war is the contributor to environmental destruction. And it's hard for anyone to deny, although too many continue to do so, that we're in the middle of a climate emergency and the promotion of war is the promotion of environmental destruction. And we recently experienced two days in a row, I think that were the hottest days on the history of the planet. Um, the US military, and we see AUKUS uh, particularly driven through US military interests and geopolitical strategic interests is the largest single institutional source of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Um, and the most pressing security threat to Australia ultimately is catastrophic climate change, not China, um, who happens to be our largest trading partner. So the cost of war is paid in, in many ways. And the main cost is human life. But uh, the environment is also a major cost of war and the economic cost is phenomenal and enormous. Overall, and uh, mixed figures were uh, incredibly interesting and I'd like to overlay them at some stage and um, uh, 
and have a look at them in more detail. And um, because the defence budget in Australia for the next year is set at fifty-two and a half billion, it's the first time it's ever exceeded fifty billion dollars. I think Australia spends around a hundred uh, in excess of one hundred and ninety-three million dollars a day uh, on the military, and this is a country with no real military threat. Um, and on top of this, we see AUKUS and the nuclear submarine deal um, costing a staggering $398 billion. Now, the former Labor Prime Minister, Paul Keating, um, he's been scathing on this question. It's been very interesting, um, scathing on the AUKUS alliance. And his um, comments have actually started a broader debate. And he's written... Um, that AUKUS has no other purpose apart to suit and comply with the strategic ambitions of the United States. And it seems very hard not to agree with him. Um, there is some opposition appearing um, within the ranks of the ALP. Um, two state conferences have expressed an opposition to AUKUS and no doubt there'll be a larger debate of ALP members at the national conference soon to be held in Brisbane. Um, AUKUS is part of ultimately US imperialism's current approach of encircling and containing China, which also includes the formation of the Quad, Five Eyes and other strategic military alliances. There's around 50 US bases in Australia, um, including training, live firing ranges, logistics material, intelligence, surveillance, communication and uh, troop bases. Um, and in addition, all Australian Army, Navy and Air Force bases are open for use by the US military at a moment's notice. So it's seen in many respects that AUKUS is a, um, a sale of Australian sovereignty as well um, at a huge cost to the people. And um, it comes at huge cost to all our communities, but to the environment and to a, a peaceful future. Our members... Um, don't want nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons in our workplaces. And we know the dangers of nuclear technology and we don't want another Fukushima. And at the same time, these huge sums are spent on a drive to war. The community and working people are living through a cost of living crisis with the highest inflation seen for, for years, along with steep interest rate rises. And wages for many years have been suppressed through conservative government policy and through harsh anti-union laws. And although wages are starting to creep forward recently, they're still not in front or meeting inflationary pressures. So real wages have in fact been cut. And despite the hardship faced by working people, governments of the world continue to plough money and adopt neoliberal and market-driven approaches to problems facing, facing us all. I mean, we still hear the mainstream narrative that increased wages drive inflation, uh, which life re life's realities have undermined over the last few years. And I think the contribution to that public debate by the likes of our fraternal union in the UK, the RMT, have been amazing and necessary. Um, and Australian inflation is also driven by obscene profit. Um, obscene profit making is, and a deliberate suppression of wages by um, conservative governments over 10 years. Um, and, you know, with a, a huge housing crisis, health, health services in decline, wages in decline and falling living standards, an environmental um, emergency and potential catastrophe threatening our very existence, there can be no doubt that massive military spending is better off directed to programs and investments that are actually in the interests of the people. Now, programs for a better health system and to improve wages for nurses, for childcare, which is criminally expensive for working people, for education, schools, for teachers, for housing, where there's a huge shortage while we have skyrocketing rents and interest rate hikes affecting everybody. And I think importantly to address the obscene injustices affecting First Nations Australians. We urgently need to build renewable energy uh, to ensure we prevent global heating from exceeding the, the 1.5 degrees C and war and military spending is a barrier to this necessary progress. 
Um, our unions campaign strongly for offshore wind. Um, we've seen that as a transition for seafarers in the offshore oil and gas industry with a flow on to jobs along the supply chain. Um, and what we're seeing even at the moment is wind zones being eroded because of military intervention, scaling back their size in multiple areas. Port Kembla, for example, has seen a, the potential for huge offshore wind and billions of dollars in investment. Um, but now the port and the community are in, are in an arm wrestle um, uh, with uh, a, a mooted nuclear submarine base being proposed, which would wipe out those renewable energy uh, developments. And May, the last May Day was interesting in Port Kembla. It's a southern suburb of Wollongong. Uh, it's a steel city, um, steel making town, manufacturing town. Um, it, it was uh, held one of the largest May Day marches ever uh, in that area in opposition to this um, nuclear madness where people wanted to protect uh, their port and their, their harbour and public space ultimately because uh, you end up with a military base, all of that stuff becomes off limits. Um, and there's clearly more jobs in that industry than in the ongoing development of industries related to the military industrial complex and war. So the ongoing building of the peace movement is critical. The ongoing development of international solidarity for peace and workers' rights is critical. And we need to fight and build the strongest, broadest links we can to stop the very real drive to war. So I'd just say, like to say um, congratulations to all of you for your ongoing efforts to fight for a peaceful world, free of nuclear weapons and war waged in the interests of global capital and imperialism, um, and look forward to further being able to uh, work uh, to that same end, because I think our ongoing work an organisation around these questions is absolutely vital. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And thanks. Thanks, Carol. Thank you very much, Foran. Thank you very much indeed. And as I'm sure you know, CND is also active in opposing the AUKUS Treaty, and we continue to be so. I don't know about the, our audience, but the thing that most struck me, struck me when you were speaking is apart from a slight difference in sort of costs and statistics, pretty well everything you said could be said about Britain. And I think that proves the point um, very, very eloquently in the background that we are all facing the same sort of problems as a result of militarization and the increasing financial costs and of course the social costs that come with that. I'm particularly glad that you touched on climate change. Just want to tell our audience that that's a um, a large part of our discussion in the second session when we've got Sam from the PCS joining us and she'll say something about defence diversification and that and also um, Steve Morse from the USA who's involved in various activities. I've had um, a number of questions already and I'll pass them over to our two speakers. Oh and by the way I've just had a, a text from Billy apologising that as he's on his phone, he's not been able to get back into the conversation. He may join us, but I suspect that's proving difficult as he's outdoors and I'm guessing that the reception is not very good. So let's have a look at some of the questions if we may. Um, I've got uh, one that is um, specifically for Billy, so I'll hold it over and we'll come back to it a bit later, which is what should the demands of the anti-war movement be? Um, and I've got another couple. Um, and I think this is one that we can direct both to Warren in his remarks about it in passing on the Cold War and China and also um, to Mick. And Thomas is asking us if an increase in military spending has been necessary to support the Ukraine to support Ukraine against Russian aggression. And how does how do our panelists think we should respond 
to this argument. So perhaps I'll take Mick first and then come on to Warren and maybe say, make a few remarks myself. Mick. Yeah, well, firstly, we come back to the issue. It's a technical point, but I think it's worth stating, <laughs> excuse me, that um, the British government accounts for its defence spending are so opaque that it's not at all clear that what's sent to Ukraine is from the military budget. Um, and we know that the aid budget has been used to support its overall efforts to support Ukraine. So that's one obvious factor. But I would put it another way. Um, is, does anyone really believe that British participation in the war in Ukraine, which in effect is a proxy war waged by Ukrainians in the main, not solely, but on behalf of NATO, uh, has that made us safer? And I would argue it really, really hasn't. So the idea that um, the military budget is necessary, it's necessary to increase it in order to pursue the war against Russia in Ukraine uh, as part of our overall defence um, is completely mistaken. It's actually, I think, making us more of a target um, and it's a drain on resources. Uh, and actually, the budget is so large now, um, way over 50 billion pounds, that, and the UK is spending nothing like that in Ukraine. Um, it's really, it can't be used. The war can't be used to justify the budget, but also I don't think the war makes any contribution to making countries like this one any safer at all. The US can pursue it because Ukraine and Russia are a long way from uh, the US um, landmass. Um, but no, there's a European war uh, with, nu with nuclear powers uh, on both sides. And that is not a, a fact which is going to make anyone in this country less um, at risk. Thanks very much, Mick. Um, before I call Warren, I'll just point out that Billy is now back on the call. He's joined as the audience, so we're just transferring him to the panel and we'll bring him in once um, Warren's made his response to the question, which is, I'll repeat it, which is that it is is the increase in spending, has it been necessary to support Ukraine against Russian aggression? And how do you think we should respond to it? Warren. I agree with Mick. That's not justified. Um, and all efforts should be made to achieve a peaceful and diplomatic solution and with everybody's collective security taken into account. Yes, I think Mick's right. It's a proxy war. Um, the Obviously, it's a lot closer geographical, geographically to um, the UK than it is to Australia, where I've got to say the, the drive to war here is almost solely focused upon China. Um, and the increases in spending are based upon um, that as a justification more than anything around uh, Ukraine and Russia. But, you know, quite clearly, the conflicts of nature are incredibly dangerous and incredibly environmentally destructive and incredibly harmful to, to you know, working people. Um, and, you know, putting more money for weapons doesn't bring peace. It brings more war. Yeah, Th thanks. Thanks very much, Warren, thank you. Um, before I call Billy, I just want to point out that amongst CND's consistent demands around the, um, around the Ukraine war, right from the start has been a call for Russian withdrawal. But we are very conscious and we continue to hope for that. We are also very conscious, as our two speakers have said, that this is not only a war which is destructive of the environment and of the people of Ukraine and of the people of Russia, the soldiers who are dying as a result of the war, but it is also the war with the potential for a nuclear confrontation and with the potential of spilling over 
into um, Britain and elsewhere in Europe. And one of the things that CND is doing at the moment is campaigning on US missiles returning to Lake and Heath. Um, I'll say something about that later so as not to interrupt the way the discussion is going. But I'm now going to pass over to Billy, who might like, like to conclude any remarks that he didn't manage yeah. to say when he dropped off. But also, Billy, we've got a specific question. Yeah which came in in your absence and that yeah. is what should be the demands of the anti-war movement on cost and on war thanks over to you yeah first of all apologies for it's been a bit of a farrago uh, this morning with the computer and the phone uh, going out so my apologies to the meeting but actually um in terms of the question it, it was i was just doing a little bit of history and then talking about being active now in terms of uh, trade union activism, I mean, all, all the stats, uh, people, what Mech and others and over the years have brought together, it's quite clear, jobs, not bombs, which if those of us are old enough to remember, that used to be one of the Labour Party NEC slogans, job, peace, and what was it, peace, jobs, I've forgotten the exact formulation, but it was definitely around jobs, uh, not bombs. So there's definitely the... Uh, you know, as a, a specific in terms of spend. But I'm always a little bit wary of being completely instrumental. You know, that if we have more, spend less on arms, we'd spend more on the NHS. Of course, that's, but that to some degree, that feels to me sometimes it can be a little bit obviously instrumental, but it, but it kind of misses the point about, or can miss the point about the issue of peace not war, because as, as I said in a, a quote from the Billy Bragg song, war's always been the boss's waster. I think the Pacific demands, off, as has to be, in the first instance, to reverse the TUC policy on increasing arms spending, has been demonstrated this morning, it doesn't do us any favours. That's not an unimportant thing. And not forgetting, Unite support, Unite in particular, supported that policy that was moved by the GMB. I'm proud to say, or glad to say, the CW wasn't one, it was one of those unions who actually spoke out against it, as did, I think, unions like us. So that would be the Pacific demand in terms of uh, what we should be campaigning about. It's more money spent on investment in the economy, as Mick says. That's definitely something which we can rally around because it, it has clear demonstrable results but i think the the reason why people should be active in the union uh, in terms of peace i think that's where you get the best cater of activists if someone can see through the nonsense of militarism then that in my view they're going to be a better better activist per se because you know they can see through the, the management lines so i think that's why I, one of the reasons why I'm an activist, in my experience, people who are anti-war tend to be better activists. And here's a little thing I found um, over the years working for, uh, when I used to work for Royal Mail, and to a certain degree, um, the, the telecom sector, because they, in recent years, the BT was kind of forced to take a number of veterans. I'm not not wrong in that per se, but it sort of went under the wire. Whereas in the States, the um, an awful lot, the, 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 Royal, the US Postal Service is a reserved occupation and you get lots of military people. Now, what is interesting, a lot of people think, well, they, de facto, therefore, the people who, become, who are from the, from the armed forces will be more right-wing that's that's the kind of theory. Well, my in my experience, that's that's the opposite, because people who have really experienced real war, death and blood and guts and all the rest of it, tend to be more, much more sober in terms of uh, doing this um, whipping up war fever in terms of activism. So that's the kind of general point I was going to make in my presentation that you'll find the best activists. People who are interested in peace will tend to be people who are interested in building solidarity. And contrary to popular belief,
People have, not always, but mainly the case that people have experienced military conflict are much more sober and serious about um, the whole question of uh, war. I mean, and I say that with real, real life experience with uh, Iraq veterans. And I mean, in one instance, I know of, um, there were some reps I was tutoring, we worked for O2. And uh, they were telling me about the mini rebellions that happened in Iraq. What in in Iraq one, uh, in in tank regiments. And I said that we, how how did this come about? And these were ex sergeants, these guys. And he said, when are you going to get your head blown off? It's it's amazing how focused you can be, in terms of. Uh, so to me, we have to draw in people around. Jobs not jobs not bombs definitely. But what we'll also find, we'll get the better grade of activists, the people who, who are anti-war. That, that, and that's uh, my experience in terms of building an anti-war movement. So what we do in terms of CND and Stop the War and all the rest of it is important to build a movement, not just in terms of the weapons of, of mass destruction, but also in terms of revitalizing our labor movement so I've tried to compensate for uh, dropping out there. And there's a bit of a story there about a communication worker losing his communication, but that's another story. Thank you. It is. Thank you, Billy. And no doubt a long story. And just to prove that last point, um, I, we've just had a message in the chat from a comrade who joined us um, from Wales saying, thank you very much for the contributions. I'm afraid I've got to go now to join a Palestine solidarity campaign picket. And indeed, I was on one in London myself a few days ago, representing CND and uh, opposing what was happening in Janine, and also commenting on that terrible anti-boycott bill that's just passed its second reading. So um, we are at the end of the session, we're going to be calling on Ray Street, who's a member of the CND committee, but also who was one of the founding, founding members on the depleted uranium campaign. And we're calling um, Ray at the end rather than at the beginning, because um, we're going to ask us specifically to talk about depleted uranium and its use um, at the moment. But before I do that, We've got a final question for that's come in for Warren, and that is it's it, and that is to ask you, Warren, what are your experiences in Australia of the Australian Labour government, and have you got any tips about how we're going to handle our Labour government when and if it comes to power? Hopefully, if it comes to power, and shift its support for the Tory government's pro-war and pro-nuclear stance. Over to you. I don't think there's any universal formula, um, but well, maybe the, what tends to shift any government is the, the ability of working people to mobilise. Um, and, you know, that broader support of the the trade unions um, uh, can, and the organised working class ultimately, is what tends to drive governments to change of any particular persuasion. Um, so I think the key is to build density, trade union unity and militancy amongst the working class. And that tends to be a, a general uh, position for any, any government. Um, I'm not sure that... Uh, from my observations, there's um, too many similarities to what what I'm seeing in um, the UK at the moment. Um, so I'll leave that to, I'll leave that to you guys ultimately. But um, people mobilising is what makes change. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, absolutely. Um, and interestingly enough, I'm sure you know this, um, I guess most of our audience do, one of the strongest unions, both on the, on the issue of anti-war and, and anti-nuclear and peace, have been your sister union, the RMT, um, 
and they and and they've been quite a strong part in part to play in international solidarity as 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 billy mentioned in his contribution okay before i call ray street i just want to welcome um steve morse who's joined us from the usa steve will be speaking in the next panel which will start in um, five minutes or so and as we did with warren a big thank you in fact even a bigger thank you i think to steve for joining us because i understand it's something like four o'clock in the morning from where you are so we're all extremely impressed with your commitments and we look forward to hearing from you very shortly i now want to invite ray street who's been added to the panel so everyone can see ray i want can you to see me uh, can you see um, me Carol? we can't no we can see your name how um, can you uh, uh, let's let's not spend time worrying about technicalities let's <laughs> just make do with your name as we did with billy because he was outdoors um so this is not strictly speaking part of our session but it's very important to those of us in cnd to register that nuclear weapons is not simply a matter of weapons on the battlefield but it's the use of nuclear materials spent uranium to provide in inverted commas conventional weapons and the sort of danger and damage that they do so over to ray you've got five minutes to quickly fill us in on that thanks very yeah. much ray thank you very much um, and thank you to all our speakers who were so good this morning um, and with such useful information for us all uh, particularly from uh, would like to thank warren but i'll come on to that in a minute um you, you often hear um, and I'm talking about the different costs of war, the costs of suffering and so on in war. Um, you often hear our governments, USA and UK, for example, talking about the values they are defending. But their values sometimes are just abysmal because the UK government has agreed to send depleted uranium munitions to the Ukraine. Now, I'm sure many of you know that depleted uranium munitions, when they are exploded, release a radioactive and toxic dust, which can spread for miles, causing ill health and suffering to civilians and contaminating the environment for years to come. And it's also dangerous even for the soldiers using it. So we actually send it to Ukraine material which will cause death more death and suffering for them it's just unbelievable and we've also just heard that the usa is going to send them cluster munitions which again <laughs> where are their principles you know cluster munitions are banned by the majority governments of the world and um they will be horrendous for the civilians there you know, farmers and families, often these small bobblets don't explode. So they'd be like mines all over the land there. It, it's just unbelievable what our governments can do. But I also want to go back to uranium and to say that um, this, we also in CND oppose nuclear power. And I just want to tune in with Warren because nobody ever mentions the fact that we the only fuel we use now for nuclear reactors and thus nuclear weapons is uranium and we get that from uranium mines mainly on the lands of indigenous first nation people and we are causing them death and suffering so that we can have the uranium for these vastly expensive and ridiculous nuclear reactors and that tunes in with australia because we do actually get uh, i'm sure warren will agree the uranium from the lands of um the first nation people there and uh, nobody ever mentions that when they're trumpeting 
the wonders of nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons that uranium is used. So there was a, uh, all the other costs of war to people who are um, suffering and actually um, often killed uh, with this uranium. And um, certainly using depleted uranium munitions is, is just unbelievable. It's just not forgivable by our government. And they know full well, it's not as though they didn't know the results because we know after they used them in the Iraq war and in the, NATO used them in the Balkans, they know full well the, what effect it has, but they can send them there because we're not going to use them here in Britain, are we? So thank you everybody. I just wanted to make that extra point about the costs, the terrible costs. And as um, Billy Hayes said, the immorality of war. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ray. And thank you very much for your work over almost 30 years on the particular issue of depleted uranium. There are some of us on this uh, call that can remember those terrible pictures of what happened in Iraq, not in 2003, but after the um, bombardment of um, 1991, those terrible pictures of um, deformed fetuses and, and so forth that, that really brought the issue of depleted uranium to everyone's attention. Okay, so I'm now going to, we're now going to move on to our second panel. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Daniel Blaney, to chair that panel. Um, and I'm going to say, ask all of you to join me in saying thank you very much to Warren, to Billy, and to, and to Ray, of course, and to Mick for taking part in what has been a very thoughtful as well as uplifting and um, um, inspiring contribution on the issue of war and nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. And I'm getting people in the chat saying thank you too. Okay, Daniel, over to you. I'm going to turn myself off. Okay, thanks very much. Um, the way we um, thought about um, uh, presenting um the issues in in today's event was uh, to follow that that conversation which we've just had with a session with the title trade unions and worker security thinking about um the way in which these issues are coming up in the kind of everyday struggles of the of the labor movement at the moment so um we've got three speakers um, I'm go I'm going to do them in this order, um, unless sometimes technology changes things. But my plan is to first call Peter Evans from uh, uh, the University and College Union, uh, then to invite Steve Morse, who's been mentioned from uh, Veterans for Peace USA, um, and then to um, end the session uh, of speakers with Sam Mason from uh, the PCS union. Um, like Carol, I will be trying to keep an eye on the um, uh, Q&A um, and uh, we'll take some questions uh, before having um, a break or those that want to leave can leave and a break for those who want to join some AGM business after that. Uh, so, um, first of all, Peter Evans, who is um, a, a senior activist in UCU, I think he's had a different change of roles, which he can probably explain better than me. He has been chair of London UCU, but I believe he's now got a different lay activist role in the union, which um, uh, I will hand over to him to introduce himself and the, the important struggles that are taking place uh, in the UCU at the moment, we, I'm sure we're all following their action very carefully, but also they've been, I was at TUC last year and their delegation uh, opposing the motion Billy referred to earlier was absolutely brilliant. So Peter, over to you. Um, Daniel, thank you very much. Comrades, thank you for inviting me here today. It really is a privilege to be here. Um, just to um, update on, on my role, I'm a member of UCU NEC and also um, Deputy Chair of the National Equalities um, Committee. 
Um, I think starting off, really, um, I just want to refer to some comments that one of my other colleagues on NEC made at the beginning of June, when he said, this is in the context of Ukraine, um, maybe next they'll want more offensive weapons to push into Russian territory um, to, mash, to match um, Russia's threat um, of the use of nuclear weapons. Well, of course, as Ray said earlier, just now, um, we have got cluster bombs going in um, now, thanks to Biden. Um, and I just looked up um, a quote in Hansard um, from, um, I think it was earlier in the month, whereby it was, it was confirmed, um, I'm just trying to bring it up, I can't find it now. Um, anyway, it was confirmed about challenger tanks and depleted uranium. Um, so um, let's, let's look at, and I've been asked to look at what we as UCU are doing, our motion that we put to our Congress that was passed, uh, and the context of um, that in, the, in, in terms of our struggle for better wages for workers in the um, further higher education se um, sector. So the motion um, basically said, the first part of the motion was one year after the brutal invasion, Ukraine has become a battleground for Russian and US imperialism. That's it in a nutshell. That's why it's a proxy war. Um, this motion was a composite um, between um, FE colleges in London, City in Islington, and um, University of Brighton from the HE sector. And the resolution was very clear. It was to call on Russia to withdraw its troops and for the UK government to stop arming Ukraine. Um, and some people, we had a debate within UCU, within UCU left, um, within the whole Congress, and that is the, the motion that ended up being, um, being passed. And I'm very proud to have been part of that debate and voting for it. Um, one of the consequences of that was um, highlighted by Andrew Murray, um, who said that the vote, UCU's vote, should give, give confidence to the anti-imperialist voices within the trade union movement to raise similar motions in union branches and conferences. And um, I know, Daniel, you referred to that at the beginning um, when you spoke about UCU position um, at TUC last year. And hopefully I will be able to conclude on, on, on that point in just a moment. But to get to that point, let's, let's look at, at exactly where we are right now. Um, and at the moment, um, we are thinking about the Ukraine situation. Yes, Russia is the aggressor. Um, the immediate um, trigger uh, of the war was, was Russia's attack their special operation. I think another state this week spoke about a special operation when it attacked the residents of Janine. Um, think of the parallels. Um, so Russian imperialism is the main driver of the conflict at the moment. Is NATO going to help? Is NATO the solution? Um, I don't think so. I mean, since its inception in 1947, um, NATO is an imperialist alliance to bring powers to maintain their interests post-World War II. It's an offensive organization. It's moved its boundaries 800 miles um, into former Soviet territory. Um, it protects the interests of the US, of Britain, of Germany, as other um, comrades said in the first um, session this morning. Um, supposed neutral states, such as Finland, have now been drawn into NATO. Can you imagine the catastrophe with Finnish and NATO troops on a border with Russia, where now we're using depleted uranium, where now we're using cluster bombs? What will that engagement be like? My goodness, I, I, I really dread to think. What about a military victory for Putin? Will that be a solution? No, 
What about a, um, a military victory for, for NATO? Will that be a solution? No, because that will just be playing out this proxy war and playing into the hands of US imperialism. Let's think about what Zelensky has said. Last year, he envisaged the envisions, I should say, the post-war um, Ukraine to be like a big Israel. It won't be liberal like Europe. Um, as a queer man, I feel very frightened by that, that illiberal thought. He went on to say, we will not be surprised if we have representatives of the armed forces or the National Guard in cinemas, supermarkets, and people with weapons. He continued, I'm confident that the question of security will be an issue for a number of, uh, of years ahead. I'm sure it will be. Chilling things. So back to the question of money and weapons. And going back to somebody, John McLean, World War I, and his famous quote was, the bayonet being the weapon with a worker at either end. And that's what we are seeing. Money will be better spent in other, other parts of the economy, not to mention the health service, and of course, my own sector, which is education, which I want to sort of finish on. Um, and just draw comrades attention to the fact that if there's higher education, further education, the other areas that we represent in UCU, which are adult community education and prison education, um, have been one of the hardest areas hit with austerity. Our pay has declined by over 35%, even before the cost of living crisis. We've, lose, we've lost over 25,000 jobs um, and we have lost millions of adult education places. The heart is being ripped out of FE. Redundancies, micromanagement, dreadful employability skills, obsessive attendance chasing. Marketization of FE since incorporation is embraced by our employers and it's policed by Ofsted. And we have had the, the worst retention crisis for over 25 years. Whilst us as the workers in the sector have received pay cuts, the college leaders salaries have been increasing year on year in real terms by 8%. The way um, further education and higher education is run at the moment reminds me of um, what Marx said in 1860 about the schoolmaster who works for a teaching factory, the teaching factory versus the sausage factory. And further and higher education at the moment is that sausage factory, that education yeah. factory. So we should be putting our money into education, not into bonds. The TUC Union Federation Conference last year, unions voted to pour more money into the British arms industry. UCU opposed that. We will continue to oppose that. So solidarity, and thank you for allowing me to explain a little the UCU situation. Happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Peter. Um, very helpful um, start to this session. Um, uh, we heard from Warren from Australia earlier. Uh, I'm now going to invite our, our next international speaker, which is Steve Morse from uh, Veterans USA. I understand that he is also going to speak to us on the People Over Pentagon campaign to cut the military budget there. Uh, always um, delighted and important to hear from uh, campaigners uh, in other countries and really have an international discussion. So, Steve, over to you. OK, thank you. Um, I hope we do well. I've been on uh, 
40 minutes and I've been thrown off. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm in Veterans for Peace in the, in the U.S. Um, I'm also a retired sheet metal worker, union sheet metal worker uh, as well. I live in Oakland, California, across from San Francisco, across the bay from San Francisco. Um, yeah, I'll explain a little about the uh, People Over Pentagon campaign. This is in the Congress. Um, the Progressive Caucus is pushing this. In this coming week, apparently, the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, will come up for a vote. And um, actually, my Congress member, Barbara Lee, who was the only person after September 11th, 2001, to oppose George W. Bush's blank check for war, uh, for which she got death threats, um, a black woman. And she is leading this, she is leading this effort. And that's, and it's to reduce the Pentagon budget by 10%. Well, 10% isn't nearly enough, but the Pentagon budget is, is crazy. The US military budget is crazy. I mean, it's, it's, as much as the next 10 countries combined. Um, you know, so we'll I'll talk some more about that. Now, um, I, was, I was in the Vietnam War, although I, rather than staying there a year, I was sent back after four months for agitating. I was part of the uh, resistance movement of soldiers, which is a much bigger movement than almost everybody seems to know these days. Um, and we, we did help stop the war. I've been in Veterans for Peace a long time. So we're starting this effort to also reduce $100 billion. I think you used the word billion. Um, hello. We, I think we have, I think we have lost um, Steve. In fact, I'm definitely lost Steve. Um, I know that I, I didn't want to interrupt too early because sometimes it just catches up. But I think on this occasion, he's actually gone completely. Um, so in those, we'll see if we can get him back. Um, and in the meantime, um, it's a, sh a shame we were just. Oh, actually, I think he is back hello steve can you hear me yes can you hear me yeah i can hear you fine you did um you did break up a bit um before i know I, I i got thrown off again yeah um <laughs> I'm sorry. so let, let me try to say a little bit on, more yeah. in, in in veterans for peace we're sponsoring it's a national group we have 120 chapters um we have this we have this uh project going the golden rule project which was a a ship that in the late 50s tried to sail into the war zones where they were doing uh, atomic tests like in the Marshall Islands. They were not allowed to get beyond Hawaii, but this ship was in disrepair and it was repaired by Veterans for Peace. And now it's been sailing around um, different parts of the U.S. and having events where it, when it, when it shows up. Now, an interesting relation to the climate crisis is that they were planning to go down the Mississippi River, you know, the biggest river in the U.S., and they could not do it because of the climate crisis had, you know, made the river so uh, shallow that it was impassable. So they had to, they had to do a different thing. And they, and they, and I, I helped start the climate crisis and militarism project within Veterans for Peace three years ago, and they hang our banner as well as being mainly anti-nuclear. Um, their message that U.S. militarism fuels climate crisis, so a banner that we have. So in Veterans for Peace, we're actually trying to bring more of a labor um, labor issues. Uh, this is part of what we're trying to do, but we're trying to, uh, within the labor movement, we're trying to 
build a challenge to militarism. And um, so we're trying to get unions to sign on to this uh, $100 billion reduction. So that's what we're working on. Uh, we're not going to do it in relation to this current NDAA thing, which is uh, vote, which is going to happen next week. Um, but we're, we're, you know, we're working on it a little more long term basis. Um, just to say something about the opposition within labor to war, back in the Vietnam War, the, there was huge opposition. And by the early 70s, much of the working class uh, was opposed to it. Later than students, but it, and, and, and working class veterans were coming back and being part of Vietnam veterans against the war and speaking out against the war. So um, where I live, there was some, there's been some more progressive history in labor so that there was opposition of the labor councils in San Francisco and in what we call the East Bay where I live, where Oakland, Berkeley area, um, 1969, 70, they came, they took positions against the war. But the national organization, AFL-CIO, was very much tied in with the Cold War and even with the CIA as well. Now that started to shift in 1995 with some new leadership. Um, but in the first decade of this century, there, um, you may remember that they, it, was, it was said that there were two superpowers, the US and world opinion. And, and on February 15th, 2003, we had the largest um, protest ever, um, 15 million people or so worldwide. And against the, against the coming war, the US war against Iraq, and at that time, there was a group, U.S. Labor Against the War, that became active and um, started in 2003. And then they got about 60 or 70 unions to, to join, to be part of that, which, was, which meant opposing the Iraq War, for one thing. And then in 2005, the AFL-CIO, the, the overall labor organization, took a position against the Iraq War, and that was a big shift. Um, and then they've taken a couple other positions since that time to redirect money from military spending to, you know, civilian spending to human needs. And so, and this is what we're, this is what we're talking about. Um, climate, you know, to address the climate crisis and to address human needs. Um, now in the, in the amendment that the Barbara Lee and the progressive and many of the progressive people are putting forward they're, they're exempting military pay and military health care from cuts. So that's not gonna be cut. So things that deserve to be cut are the price gouging of war contractors, uh, the 750 overseas bases uh, that, <laughs> this is not about defense of the US, right? This is about overreach. This is about imperialism, uh, these things. So all those things deserve to be cut but we have to publicize um, that. And that activity that US labor against the war did in the first decade of the century is not really there now. So we're trying to, we're trying to revive that. And there does seem to be, um, in spite of the huge denial about militarism, um, there does seem to be uh, some rising sense of the outrage of constant price gouging by, by war contractors. Um, so I think, you know, there has been some, the, the, it, where I live on the West Coast, the, the Longshore Union, International Longshore and Warehouse Union has, has a long left-wing tradition. They, in 2008, they shut down all the 29 West Coast ports uh, against the Iraq war and they've, and they've done other very progressive things. They were, they, you know, they refused to unload South African ships in the eighties and were a strong part of the anti-apartheid movement at that time. And they're just on the West coast, the, the union on the uh, East coast and the Gulf, um, Gulf of Mexico is, is a different kind of union that doesn't have that tradition. Um, I think we, we need to look at there's a lot of denial in the US around militarism and climate crisis 
and racism, particularly among white people around racism. And, and they're tied in because the racist nature of the US military doesn't get, doesn't get put front and center among people who are anti-racist, for example, uh, people of color who are fighting racism or white allies. Um, I mean, the military, the wars have been racist wars. Since World War II, if you look at Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and some of the lesser, um, lesser war involvements of the US, these are all against people of color and, um, and the civilian deaths and stuff become, become less because, because of racism. So I think racism does need to be addressed. Um, the relationship between climate, uh, militarism and racism, all those things need to come together. So many times in the US, you have groups that do some measure of intersectionality, maybe unions, maybe they're fighting for single payer health, which of course is a scandal in the US that we, that we have such a dysfunctional health system and not a universal system. And we still spend twice as much per person. Uh, so things like that, but then militarism doesn't get included in that. So that's, that's a, you know, in a sense, we don't have much time, but, you know, with the climate, uh, the climate crisis happening worse and worse all the time, but we, but we have to, we have to also dig deep and with labor, um, you know, it's not a quick thing, particularly in the US. Now, one thing that is not known about the war industries is that they, they're really not good employers. I mean, they're, they're making weapons of mass destruction and some people um, know in the anti-war movement, that's well known of course, but it's not very well known. Like for example, the union density in the last 20 years in the war industries has, has decreased very much because they're acting like other corporate power in the US to trying to be go non-union, trying to go to what they call right to work states, right to work for less is what it is, you know, where you, where you, uh, where unionism is, is weak. And so they have been moving to those areas. Uh, you don't have healthy working conditions. You have toxic, working with toxic materials. You have a toxic work environment for women, very sexist work environment typically. Uh, and in, in terms of job creation, you know, a million dollars spent on war industries creates fewer jobs than almost every other sector. Fossil fuels is also is also very low in there, but if, if you look at education and health, that's there 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 are much higher number of jobs that are created. So um, Um, again, I'm always reluctant to intervene too soon, but I think we may have lost Steve again. Sometimes it breaks up, but sometimes it seems like we've lost him, although he's the current, he looks like he's frozen, but I think he may actually have dropped off entirely. Um, um, I'm just going to say at this point, um, I was thinking of saying this at the end of his contribution. I think we, in Labour CND, we would particularly appreciate his... Um, point um about the um the links between militarism the climate and racism and those are um uh links that we have tried to make in the past we have made successfully a little bit in this session uh today but i think there's always more we can do uh, what i'm going to suggest at this moment is actually i just move on to our next speaker because i think this neatly feeds in because sam mason um, works for PCS and um, uh, she will explain her job far better than me but it does really involve very much linking these issues uh, which um, sometimes uh, we use the phrase just transition which uh, is in relation to both uh, carbon intensive um, employment and the just transition away from that but also uh, a transition away from militarism and the two are linked because of course the carbon footprint of militarism is 
enormous. So, Sam, uh, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and say say your piece. And if we can hear from Steve again at the end, of course, so I will bring him back. Thanks very much, Sam. Great. Thanks, Daniel. And yeah, such a shame to lose Steve at that point, but um, hopefully he'll come back and join us. And I mean, I really appreciate hearing from Steve because I have struggled to get anybody from the US labor movement um, for a long time now to participate in discussions like this. And um, it, it was welcome to hear Steve give some background to what's happened with the um, the labour movement there, particularly since the Iraq war, because it was um, strong. So hopefully now making these connections, we can revive some of this. And, and partly because also, and I think it's come out in the presentations earlier, um, it can be quite an isolated place at the moment working on this agenda. Um, and just to say, to take a step back. So yeah, in terms of my role in PCS, I'm a policy officer in PCS. I work on sustainability, climate change, trade and international. Um, but a lot of my work is around climate change and this concept of a just transition and um, obviously particularly moving workers um, out of not just high carbon industries, because we tend to talk in terms of a whole economy um, because decarbonisation will impact every worker in some way, obviously to lesser or greater degrees, but um, we, we need to ensure that we, we make the connections across and it's not just about a fossil fuel or um, energy transition, it's much wider than that. And of course that does include defence sector workers as well, um, who are working in an industry which is very carbon intensive um, and the whole military sector has huge amounts of um, green greenhouse gas emissions, of course. Um, I think the first thing to say, because one of the things we, um, this session was kind of labelled as trade unions and worker security, and it is talking about really what is that notion of real security for workers, um, if we're talking about job security in, in the longer term, and as we know, it's not unusual um, or unique just to the UK, we've got increasing precariousness of work, um, we've got increasing inequality globally, we've got increasing um, lack of social protections, and we, we see that here um, in the rollback around, you know, social security and, and the, the welfare state and access to um, good health and education, for example. Um, so all, the, all these things are happening, but if we want real worker security, then I think what we, we have to do is really be addressing what are the key challenges of our time, which is the threat of nuclear war and wars in itself, and of course climate change, and central to that has to be a peace agenda, which is underpinned by this notion of a just transition for workers across all areas of the economy, as I said. But um, I think also what we have to change is to try and tackle the, the narrative that we're seeing now predominating. Um, and it's interesting, I actually made a link with Steve through a research contact in the US, a woman called Vivian Price, who worked on a project which was um, led by a researcher in the UK um, last year through the British Academy on the necessity of a transformational approach to just transition defence sector workers' views on decarbonisation, diversification and sustainability. And that looked at workers both in the UK and in, in the US and is really worth um, looking at as well because some very interesting things have come out of that. But I think one of the things that that research also points to is about the, the dominant hegemony of how we, we talk about um, these issues, which are obviously driven by governments that are warmongering and are driven by the corporations as well. And it's related to this kind of treadmill of production and this treadmill of destruction. And of course, in our world, what we want to see workers in is socially useful work and ecologically useful work um, that responds to those issues of human need um, and not is what we're seeing now. Um, as the, the the greed narrative and the war narrative, because of course the um, energy com uh, sorry the energy companies the um, defence sector broadly is making lots of money out of war it always does and you know we haven't had very little coverage of the obscene profits that um, the defence manufacturers are making at the moment um, off the back of the war in Ukraine 
Um, of course, it was alluded to, um, well, not alluded to, it was said very clearly in the, the first panel, you know, what we're facing now in terms of climate change. And I know Warren mentioned about, you know, we're now wit witnessing the hottest average world temperatures on record. Um, and, you know, the, the UN is even saying that we have now lost control over climate change. Um, I, you know, I don't know what stronger language needs to come out for people to wake up to this reality. Um, I think the other thing that doesn't get talked about a lot as well is the increasing prevalence of extreme uh, droughts. And obviously, mostly we will associate these very sadly with Africa. Um, who are going through horrific um, levels of drought at the moment, which is, of course, forcing displacement and impacts on people's livelihoods and um, ability to survive in some of those areas. But some of you may have picked up the news. Montevideo in Uruguay has just one week of drinking water available, and that's just been announced. And just to think about that, you know, it, it's quite incredible. And this is an increasingly common phenomenon across the world. Um, it's not just linked to climate change, but obviously it's linked to our industrial activity and industrial agriculture um, as well, which all feeds into that as well. And again, it's been mentioned about the environmental destruction of war and, you know, the war in Ukraine and, you know, the, the horrific developments around um, depleted uranium, the announcements yesterday, yesterday um, just sort of beggars belief really why we really do need to be um, striving around this message of peace because we cannot deal with these other challenges unless we really um, drive home that message that we, we need to get obviously diplomatic solutions to this and, and have a more peaceful world and just say you know the the size of global carbon emissions um, in terms of relation to militarism is not particularly well known those of you who are familiar with um the work of Stuart Parkinson and scientists for global responsibility have done a, a lot on this um they're not included within the UN COP processes um either so this all happens outside and it's very opaque um about those admissions so that is another um, reason why we need to be um addressing that and, and tackling the increased militarization as well and I thought you know, it's really worth um, interesting in the, the report I, I just mentioned at the start um, that whilst, you know, we, we're told there isn't money for public sector wages, for example, as we know, there's always money available for war. Um, and even in that report, a quote from somebody who was interviewed who works in defence manufacturing has de described the defence industry essentially as a magic money tree. Um, and obviously linked to powerful lobbyists, and that's similar what we see within the fossil fuel industries as well. Um, and it's no irony and a big contradiction. Um, there's been reference to the motion that was passed at TEC Congress last year calling for increased defence spending. And I know certainly, I mean, PCS did a, a oppose that motion. Um, and I know in some of the other contributions in opposing that motion that, you know, the irony was not lost that the same Congress was passing motions on just transition to deal with the impacts of, of climate change and on, on workers. And yet here we are calling for more spending, um, military spending, and of course, um, and, and linked to the manufacturing, linked to the AUKUS programs and Trident um, renewal programs. And Rolls-Royce last, last month announced a thousand new jobs in Derby um, because they are the government's confirmed supply of nuclear reactor pl um, plants to power attack submarines as part of the AUKUS agreements. And these are jobs which will be supported by public subsidy. Um, and that should be money, of course, which is going into jobs for socially and ecologically useful productions. Um, so whilst clearly they're welcomed by the trade unions in Derby, um, they're not the jobs that we are arguing for. And I just want to say quickly um, before wrapping up a little bit about Labour Party policy at the moment, because you know there had been some welcome announcements around the Green Pos Prosperity Fund um, and Keir Starmer um, announcing the end of licensing future new North Sea oil and gas projects. But as we saw, those were particularly the North Sea oil and gas projects was quickly watered down under attacks from the GMB union, specifically calling them naive and post populist, but also Unite joining in. However, they did at least emphasize the need for more detail on about how we will transition out of North Sea oil and gas. And of course, that does have to be part of it. But 
hidden within a lot of that as well, unfortunately. Now we're talking about fiscal rules, that's why the 28 billion that was committed in the Green Prosperity Fund, um, you know, because the, the the message that Labour wants to put across about wanting to be trusted on the finances, but you know, they have to be trusted on climate change. And we certainly see that younger people are not trusting them on climate change at the moment. And um, and I, I think rightly getting criticism on that. We know that this current government is going backwards in terms of action. Um, that is of little surprise. Um, but you know, the Labour Party or any other party for that matter cannot give way to the political expediency addressing the realities of climate change. And I think as part of that, we've really got to drive home. And it's been, you know, I think said um a few times now in this meeting, and very importantly, we have to link all these struggles together. And you know, they are sides of the same coin, they're not um just being anti-war. We have to be anti-war to obviously combat climate change. We have to join the dots. And if we're internationalists and if we're anti-racist, and I was really pleased to obviously to hear Steve make that point. Um, you know, we, we cannot say we're anti-racist if we're quite happy to plow money into a defense sector that's going to be put, frankly, as we've seen, into um arms which are going to be um for Saudi Arabia and destroying people. Um, you know predominantly black and brown people in, in countries like the Yemen, for example. So we have to link this up. We do have to mobilise and join our forces and build our trade union movement on this. And it was welcome. And I think the final thing that I would just say is at the National Trade Union Council's um, conference back in June, um, they did pass a very good motion, one on Ukraine and another on um, about defence spending, um, which has called on the TEC to back peace as the business of unions protecting workers, jobs, livelihoods and the livable environment in the UK and internationally moving away from weapons manufacture and arms sales that can result in dire consequences for workers in the in countries. And we have to popularise that motion and get that out there and um, build in our trade unions for that position. Thank you. No. Whoops. Hi. Thanks, Sam, uh, very much. And um, I'm delighted to say Steve is back with us. Um, so, Steve, thank you for, for for coming back. It must be a bit frustrating for you. Uh, we, we obviously have just heard <laughs> Sam, as you've noticed. Um, I'll invite you to say whatever it was you were going to um, to end with. But I'll also say that the, the question's coming directly for you. So I might as well ask this now, maybe you can wrap it into your comments, which is how aware is the North American public um, of the danger of the danger of nuclear confrontation that the Ukraine war poses? So that's the question for you, uh, if you wanted to answer that and obviously any other comments you were preparing to make before. Thanks. OK, I was just about done when I got cut off. But th the last thing it, I had wanted to say was about just transition that Sam just mentioned that um, we're trying to make sure this gets applied to workers in the military industry. So as part of um, and that's not in the amendment. And we, we want to talk to the Congress about that, Congress members about that and their aides, um, that just transition needs to apply not just to fossil fuel workers and impacted communities and people in the global south but also people in the military industry so that they don't get thrown under the bus when uh, you know if things close if they get contract which we which we're trying to do we're trying to contract those industries um, decimate them uh, You know, I could nineteen the fear of new um, and the grill uh, 
Oh dear. Um, okay, I think we. I think we heard the um, the end of uh, Steve's contribution, and it was for me. It was breaking up uh, when I, I think he was then going on to the question that the public had put to him. But um, while we are seeing if he can join us again, um, I've got a question for Peter. Um, um, it's a question really about the the industrial action taking place and what's the um, what's the kind of relationship or if there a relationship between students and UCU um, uh, members um, is there um, are the students supportive of the action and um, that the, I, I suppose there's related questions about your perception of the student movement as obviously a very important part of any political um, current so a question for you about that which can be extrapolated into kind of the, the wider discussion thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, the students, the student movement um, is, I would say, solidly behind um, those of us that are taking action at the moment. Um, comrades in HE um, have been in dispute of different, differing types um, for the last four years. Um, I will park the leadership, um, i.e. The, the GS's office, um, on one side for a moment. Um, but what I would say is that, yes, the, the students are with us. They re one, of, one of the actions that we're taking is marking assessment boycott, which actually means that um, some students waiting for graduation will, their graduation will be delayed um, because their work will not be able to be accurately assessed. Management are coming in in some institutions and saying, well, we will um, get that assessment done elsewhere. Um, so they're trying to get scab labour to actually undertake that work. Um, and they are penalising members who are engaged in the marketing boycott and trying to um, dock their a whole month's salary. Um, marking is one part of teaching. Um, there's preparation, there's delivery, there's marking, there's planning. So it's, you know, it's one little bit of it, a significant bit, but they're trying to come in like that. Students are being supported. Students are on the picket lines. Brighton, where they're trying to get rid of 100 lecturers, where they were giving out notices of redundancy, p &O style, on Twitter. Students occupied the university building. And they had to be dragged out by the by the police. So across the, U the UK, I can cite lots of examples of where students are working and supporting us in, in our struggle for a better education system, not just about the wages, but it's all the other things as well that we could do a whole webinar on, if not more. Thank you. Um, I've got another question that's um... Uh, more general um but um as um a lay activist uh, perhaps peter is better placed to answer than um, a policy officer but i'll ask i'll invite anyone to say what they want which is how should we organize this agenda union by union um um and um so uh, there's questions there about what Billy was talking about earlier about challenging the TUC uh, decision last autumn. I suppose a, a, a similar question, which maybe Sam would like to address, is is um, in your work um, what is going on um, across the union movement in terms of different unions and um, uh, taking up these issues, and I, you, you can answer it how you want. Sam, shall I go to you first? Okay. Yeah. Um, I should just say, I mean, obviously I'm a policy officer and I'm, you know, full-time official for the union, um, but I am also a GMB member and a trade union activist and a member of my local trades council. So, um, but yeah, I mean, good, good to have Peter answer that as well. But, um, I think in terms of the, the cross the unions, I mean, um, unfortunately we have a lot of different policy positions, um, around 
I mean, if, if we're talking about the, the just transition and, and what that means, um, certainly from a PCS perspective, we've always said that it has to be a transformative transition. And um, just to root that is really, we took inspiration from the South African trade unions um, and they're kind of very left working class approach to it that, you know, this is, it's not just about renewable energy transition when you've got, say, somewhere like South Africa, when the huge levels of youth unemployment, huge levels of people without access to energy, um, that it ne really needs to be discussed in a way that addresses the other underlying issues that we have in, the, you know, many of our um, societies and economies um, as well. And I think that we've always said it's not about a green jobs swap um it has to be about ucu members being paid properly um and a proper education system it has to be about health and social care it has to be about having an integrated public transport system and it has to be about putting money where we are going to make the the biggest progress so sort of one thing i, I failed to sort of um i think address in my initial contribution was obviously the issue around nuclear um both nuclear weapons and nuclear energy we are opposed to nuclear energy um, that is directly linked to um, the weapons system. Um, governments openly admit to that now, where they were more reluctant to do so before. And I, I think also as well, these moves towards um, so small modular reactors, for example, that are now direct links between some of the solutions that are being proposed on a technological basis for the civilian side that are directly linked to the de defense and military side. Um, and I think, you know, we we have to be aware of that and we have to, why well, they, we already say they're four solutions, but there's even more reason why they're not the solutions um, we should be, um, we should be chasing after. So I've probably gone a little bit off track there, but anyway, thank you. Um, thanks. And um, yeah, Peter, would you, would you like to answer that question in your own way? And then I'm I think we just got time to hear from uh, Steve one more time. And then I think we'll be we'll be closing for a break. So, Peter. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Jay. Um, yeah. So organizing union by union. Um, well, I would say as a grassroots activist that we need to move away from example, the McAlevey model of, of organizing. Um, and we can work grassroots up um, and have, in the same way, if we're organizing um, an industrial action campaign, we can have our strike committees um, that are organized by the members. Um, with, with this agenda as well, we could do it as a member-led, member-organized way, um, coming out of the bureaucracy, um, so to speak. Um, and we also need to do it, of course, um, in an internationalist way, um, because that's linked. And looking at the other intersectionality is looking at, um, at racism and also um, gender disparity. Um, so I think we need to bring all those things together um, when, we, when we think about how we're going to, to go forward and, and organise. Um, so a, a brief, solidified answer, um, but I hope it helps. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. And Steve, what I'm going to do, so we don't, hopefully don't lose you again, I'm just going to turn your video off in case that improves uh, the audio. And you just want to make whatever your final remarks were. Um, and uh, then I think, unfortunately, we're probably then out of time. Thanks very much, Steve. Unmute. OK, um, just appreciate being here and kind of hearing things about your perspective and and the places where the UK is more advanced. Um, I mean, after all, you have a Labour Party and Australia has a Labour Party, and I know that's a mixed bag, but uh, it's it's better than not having one, as is true in the US. And so there's uh, it's, it's, it's good to hear, um, you know, 50 billion pounds you know, that's too much for the military, but it's, if we had that, if we were limited to that in the US, that would be pretty, so much better than what we've got. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, thanks very much, 
much. Um, we uh, would definitely have liked to have gone on and on. And there's, there's quite a few questions which I just don't think uh, we can we can cover now. Um, so um, for, for all of you still participating, Labour CND is a, a specialist section of CND that um, uh, is for CND members who are also members of the Labour Party to talk about how we can advance CND's campaigning work inside the party. And obviously related to that is um, uh, the, the strength of um, the position in the trade unions, which is still an important part of the party. Um, so what we are going to do is have a short break and then those who have registered, if you're in, if you're just down as an attendee at the moment, um, we'll bring you back in. Don't don't quit the the, the Zoom link. Uh, we'll bring you back in for um, and promote you to a panelist. So everyone's on the panel for some short AGM business. Um, and uh, when we will agree our committee for the next year. Uh, and hear some reports and, and hear, hear, hear a couple of motions. Um, so I think we are going to have a half hour break and then um, we will have our AGM business at half one. I think that's right. No one will correct me if I've got that wrong. Is that right? Uh, just, just to chip in, um, it's a 25 minute break and the AGM is preceded by a keynote speech, a quick one from Tom Unterrena, who's the chair of CND. Good point. But OK, anyway, yes. See you at half past one. Thank you. <laughs> 